so I guess thank you guys for joining once again. Um, uh, it's been very, very nice going through these sessions itself. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to be taking essentially three chapters, but they are, they are very short chapters. So we're starting with um, workflow projects. Then we're going to uh, kind of preview what Rango means, then end up with tables. So they're very short chapters, and we could probably go through them pretty quickly. Um, so if at any point, if you guys can't hear me, just let me know. I'm going to be using the book for um, for projects and the introduction part of Rango. Uh, then I'll be using my notes for uh, the other part of table. All right. So we'll probably start with projects. Um, so the general idea of I think chapters that are called workflow, first of all, is to kind of give like best practices uh, whenever you're using R. Um, this one is kind of specifically focused on um, the idea around projects. So how do you start and how do you save? And what other best practices can you kind of think about? Um, and we had Lee kind of presented this was what is real, right? <laughs> It's a very interesting, uh, interesting topic, right? So the first thing that I think he is trying to teach us is um, whenever you're writing like like a code, right, uh, or you kind of assign objects, you could probably think that the entire code they have written and you know, those objects have assigned is end or be all of what you know you're supposed to have done. Um, however. What he's trying to teach is our scripts kind of needs to be like the, the thought process itself, right? And his major point is if you have an R script, you can recreate your entire environment, right? But if, if you do, if it's much harder to recreate the R script from your environment, right? Um, and one of the ways that he kind of teaches this best practice is if you go to your options tab, try to disable this part. So restarting your, your R data file at startup, I'm moving this to never. Um, I mean, for me, I mean, this, this button for me is usually ticked because uh, I, I, I think everybody has different ways that you know, the function we are. Um, but I, I guess the major idea here is to kind of force you to think through how are you codifying your R script itself um, uh, rather than relying on R on R to um, kickstart your script from, from the beginning for you, right? Uh, so like you said here, obviously this is going to cost you some short term pain. <laughs> so I can imagine if I, if I have to adopt this, for example, I imagine there's a lot of things I'll probably have to relearn uh, whenever I want to kickstart my R. Um, then the other thing that he tries to teach is where does your analysis live, right? Um, and I guess this, this was a good learning point for me because I'm a beginner user of R. And one of the biggest problems I think I've always had is creating working directories, right? My R files are usually everywhere. You know, they're usually scattered all over my desktop. And one of the things that, you know, it kind of teaches is having like a proper working directory to, for you to store all your R files, right? And you can kind of call on this working directory whenever it is that you want to kick off a particular, particular work itself. Right, and I will probably talk about that as we go through, as we go down this chapter. Right. Um, so one of the things it says is, if you want to figure out, out what your current working directory is, you could just use this, this function itself. So get working directory. Um, it kind of gives you this straightforward. Um, and yeah, so <laughs> I, I decided to highlight this because uh, this is like a call out. Um, so, uh, so what I was trying to say here is, I mean, you're already six chapters into this book already, so you can't necessarily think of yourself as a beginner anymore, right? So it's kind of important that you start doing things a bit more cleanly, right? Um, he also mentioned that you could set working directory this way. So, I mean, you could probably use this function to set working directory, but there are better ways to do this. And now that you should think of yourself as you're no longer a beginner, probably choose the better ways that you kind of want to uh, progress here. I think the final thing that this chapter kind of talks about is just the difference between paths and directories, right? And also how they are different for different kind of um, um, operating systems, 
right? Uh, so for individuals that use Mac or Linux, um, and individuals like me that use Windows, right? Um, so he said the major difference between path and directories is one is how you separate the components of the path, right? So Mac and Linux uses like the forward slash, right? So you can do plots forward slash diamonds of PDF. Well, Windows user like me will use it like a backslash, right? So R can work with either one, right? Uh, but you know, this he, he did mention that this backslash kind of means something special, right? Um, so you know, you probably have to kind of think about it. And for me, I guess I kind of have to now adopt the Linux Max now uh, if I want to go forward here, yeah. right? The other way that they are different is what is called absolute paths, right? Um, so it defined this as this is a path that points to the same place regardless of your working directory, right? And they usually look different. Like so, so in Windows, for example, they usually start with a C, right, and a colon, right, or two backslashes, um, similar to kind of what they explained in this first point here, right? Uh, Why in Mac or Linux, they kind of start with like a front slash, just one forward slash, right? Um, and um, one of the things that I kind of advised is, especially individuals that are like, let's say, uh, in fields where, you know, your scripts, for example, are going to be shared, you should absolutely never use absolute parts in your script uh, because, you know, it kind of makes it difficult for you to share because you don't know what sets and other individuals are kind of using. Um, then the final difference here is, you know, simple difference is just where the tilde sign kind of points to. So the tilde sign is a convenient shortcut to your home directory. And we'll see that when we are trying to create like a new project. So I'll just run through this because I think this is this is pretty straightforward. So one of the things he also shows is like how do you create a new project itself? So you could go to file, go to new, create new project, go to new directory, empty project. In my version, you have new project. Um, uh, you put in like the, the the name of the directory you want to use. Then you can set the sub directory. One other thing that he kind of advises is if you think clearly on how you uh, on where you where you um, put your subdirectory because it might be difficult to actually look at it. And I think it's that's one of the problems that I've faced before kind of using um, using R. Uh, like I said, most of my files are usually everywhere. So thinking clearly where you want to put your subdirectory is kind of one of the most important things you want to do, right? So when you've completed this entire process, you can kind of call it using the get work directory function, and uh, I, you know you can you can save this. So you kind of give like a quick you know, quick way to test what you have done. You, you can save this file, the diamond arrows file here, and kind of start it again, and you kind of see what it's going to look like at the end, right? So in summary, right, what the chapter is just trying to teach is like having a solid workflow around working directories and projects, saving files and things like that. So it's a pretty straightforward folder. And I think for most, for most um, chapters that have this workflow, they're quite interesting how they are brought in between different chapters. Um, and the idea there is just to have like best practices that you work with um, as you kind of go forward. So I'll probably stop there, see if there are any questions in any kind of way before we kind of uh, move forward. So at least I try to clear that out in like 10 minutes itself. Um, so you guys just give me a verbal confirmation if you want me to go forward or not. Yeah, just... Yeah. Uh, so for the book, where is real is what you can repro reproduce. Um, we can say that. Sorry, I, I think I missed your question, Mr. Rado. Um, can we say that the book is saying that is real that what we can reproduce? Or, or what is the answer? Um, yeah. For, for the question, what is real? What what do yeah. you think? Because so I I think, I I think I think what what the book is trying to teach is um, a you you can have your own definition of what real is, um, but the best way to kind of think about it before you you kind of create a script or create start any work itself is don't necessarily rely a lot on your environment, like like the objects that you have created, you know, or the variables you have assigned or things like that. Don't necessarily like, always think about 
how will the app script kind of look like at the end? Because that's that's what that's the file that you're going to end up sharing, right? Um, mm -hmm. So if if you think in just individual code, for example, then you're you're largely just working for yourself, right? But but if you're thinking about if I'm going to share this entire block of code itself, how will it look like on a, on a, another individual's desktop? Always think in R scripts whenever it is that you kind of want to work. I think that's one of the things that I. I, I got from the book. So you can define real how you want to define real. Just that the best practice is always kind of put other people in mind whenever you are creating your um, uh, your R code and always thinking scripts rather than just the code code itself. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So can I can I go to the next next part now? Yes. Yes, you can. Thank you very much. All right, so this is our, this is a, this is very short. This is literally like two minutes. So this is just kind of takes us back to what Ademi started with when we started this entire cohort, right? So this this shape we started with, and the book was very clear that the way you are likely going to work through in a in a data project is obviously going to be around. Um, uh, like importing the data or tidying the data and transforming it before you kind of get to visualization. But the book was very intentional around starting with visualization because like Hadley said, it's kind of the most exciting part, right? Um, so after we're kind of done with that, like visualization and modeling, then we're now coming back to import, tidying and transforming. So import, tidying and transforming is under what is called the Rango, right? And the idea there is just how do you pre-process your data um, uh, for you to kind of make it sensible for you to either visualize or model in any kind of way. So under this Rangu part, there are a number of chapters, uh, like almost you know, seven of them there about. We are only going to talk about one, which is the table. And the table literally just starting from like the basics itself, like the, uh, the, the data type, right? That you're going to be working with. That's kind of what Tibu is about. So this entire page is literally just giving you a rundown of what Rango would mean. First we import, then we tidy, then we transform, right? And there are other things that we're going to learn as we, as we kind of go along the way. Right, so if I start with tables, so let me go to my notes. Can you guys see my notes? Not yet. Okay, let me see. I think I might have to reshare. Let me try again. Um, I always have a problem with Zoom. I think I let me just do my entire screen. Can you guys see my notes now? Yes. Fantastic. So yeah. unfortunately, I mean, if you use the R4DS link, um, that we were given. Uh, so the link is not is not complete on the tables. I mean, literally just give like learning objectives. So I decided to create mine. Um, I I mean, I, I don't know how to use GitHub yet, but I, I also don't know how to save this. I've kind of proposed changes, but I think um, it kind of has to be accepted by either John or the individuals that are running the, the Slack group itself, right? Uh, before we can uh, kind of move forward. So I just created this, this note itself, and I, I do hope at some point I can, I can save this so that I don't lose them at some point. So the idea of tables, um, I think there are three major things that we're going to cover on the tables that we kind of touch on the exercises. I found this interesting book that kind of did the solutions of the exercises itself. So we'll just run through them at the end of this class. So we should be able to finish this before, at least before in, in, in less than 45 minutes. So there are three things we're going to learn on that tables. Uh, first is how to create them. Um, then how to compare, comparing and contrasting them with the normal data frames that we know. Then how to convert a data a table back to a data frame if we need it, right? But one of the things that the book was really interested in trying to teach was um, why we should favor using tables over data frames, right? Now, so I mean, data frames are pretty, they're pretty standard, right? So if you start off with R, I think this is one of the first data type that you probably be introduced to. Um, 
And uh, what we are trying, what we are trying to learn here is, you know, what is the benefit of kind of using tables rather than data frames, right? So let's start with what are tables, right? So there are like six or seven things I think I wrote on the. So the one is they are part of the tidyverse package. So before you kind of kickstart this, you kind of have to load library tidyverse, right? They are data frames, right? But they kind of tweak some of the older behaviors to make life a little easier. So as soon as we kind of run a run a table, like when, when we get to, uh, let me see if I can pull up my R itself. Um, you you would see like some of the the um, the the old habits that they kind of help out with here. So an example here is if I if I run this iris that you know this iris data. Right. I'm sure we've kind of used it when we started this, this cohort itself, right? It kind of expresses everything possible. But the idea of a table is it just shortens it, right? So it just makes it easier and a bit more cleaner for me to kind of visualize immediately. So I can call a table right now um, for iris. I can see the columns. I can see the rows. It tells me how many more rows I have, you know, and tells me that like the total. There are five columns. There are 150 rows, right? It gives me like the first 10. Right, and try to, you know, the, the the type itself or the class of of each of the um, of the columns, right? So that's one of the biggest benefit that TV kind of brings. But it says here that, however, it does less than data frame, right? So is you you can't change the name of a variable. You also can't create row names, which is one of the biggest benefit that data data frames kind of have. So like if you're working with like if you import an Excel file, for example, that already has named rows and you kind of, you know, you find out that you have a problem with your rows, um, is, is you can't actually do that with the table, right? Uh, you can't rename it with the table. So the idea of the table, similar to what I just said now is they are designed such that you don't overwhelm your console when you print large data frames. So like for individuals like myself that are beginner users of R, for example, um, uh, I mean, when you want to call a data set, it's very easy for you to just write iris. I mean, there are other functions I kind of learn uh, across like, you know, like using the head function, for example, um, and, and things like that, that kind of summarizes. But the table, table kind of makes it a bit easier for you. If I convert a data frame to a table, I just call that, data, that object itself, right? Uh, and it just makes it easier for me to kind of visualize here, right? Um, then the the so one of the things that I that I found interesting in this chapter was, uh, you know, like how, it's actually difficult to change base R without breaking the existing code. So most of the innovation that we are going to see across R itself is going to come in packages, which is one of the reasons why Tibu is actually part of a package, right? <laughs> and you know, it's get, even no matter how many how many times you update your R, you know, some of these things are not going to be changed. So most of the updates you are going to be seeing are going to come in the packages they are going to be using, which is you know quite important. Then the other thing is, I mean, if you want to learn about tables, uh, you can actually use this this itself, so this function itself, so big net table to learn more a little bit more about a bit more about um, tables, right? Uh, then we'll come back to this at the end, but I just had to put here, I put this here. So if 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 I have a table and I want to convert it back to um, uh, to a data frame, I can use this function. So as the data the frame um, to kind of convert it back to um, to a data frame. So I guess the next question is going to be how do I create tables? So now that we've said all these nice things about tables, so how do I create them? So there are, there are three major ways by which you can do that. Number one is you can coerce a data frame to a table using as table. So that's very similar to what this represents. Uh, this right here, right? So I can I can literally like coerce a data frame, this iris data frame, uh, to a table using this function as table, right? The second way is from individual vectors with use, using a table like this itself. Here it allows you to use variables that you just created. So I think I have that somewhere. So that's it, right? Um, so individual variables that I created. It allows me to immediately convert all this to a table rather than having to do it in, you know, in different steps, right? I can easily convert this to a table, right? The fourth way, the, the third way rather is a function called treble, right? Interesting part is this extra R. So this is short for transposed table. I always find it very interesting how individuals always name their functions. 
So this is short for transposed table uh, and it's customized for data entry in code, right? So if I want to enter a piece of data, which I'll show soon, uh, the colon headings are defined by formulas that using a tilde sign and the entries are supported by commands. So this, this is right here. Um, so they are separated by the tilde sign and they are separated by, by commas, right? Uh, then you can see how it kind of looks like when you kind of enter this function itself. So now it has created like an entire data frame for you in form of a table, right? It just instead of having to do, you know, creating an object X, Y, and Z, you can easily do it up front right here, right? Um, then the next part of the learning objective is comparing and contrasting tables with, uh, with base R, uh, with the data frames that, you know, we find in base R. So there is, it mentioned here that there are, there are two major uh, differences between a table and a, a data frame, right? I'm not sure if I've skipped the points. Let me see, let me go back to the notes, creating tables. Yeah, I, I think I'm on the right track. Okay. Um, so like, what is the major difference? So he said there are just two major differences. The, the one that is explicitly explained a lot more in detail is the printing one. Right, the printing difference. Then the subsetting difference, I mean, it's explained, but we'll learn about this a lot more in chapter 15, right? So um, the first thing you notice is um, if I create this table, so similar to what I mentioned up here, one of the ways of creating a table is I could, um, uh, where's that again? Yes, yeah, so for this, so I could make each object, for example, become a table using this entire function, and I can, you know, literally ascribe like an op, like if a, an a, an object in inside a table function, right? If I want to print it, like if I create this, for example, and I run this and that, then the first thing you realize is um, uh, it doesn't necessarily pull out the entire, you know, entire data itself, right? Everything I've created here it doesn't actually pull everything out. It just gives you like a snippet, right? So it just shows you quickly what you're looking for, but also gives you some summary. So like a thousand rows, five colons, and also 994 more rows, right? And like I said earlier, it's, it's literally designed in a way where it doesn't overwhelm your console, right? Um, so so it, it also tried to do like a contrasting here. So an example here is, let me just switch back here. Uh, let me see if I... Right, so an example here is, if you're using a data frame, right? So I can, I can call a data frame using this, right? And I can print, I can determine the number of rows by specifying it. I can also specify the, the width itself. This function just decides to put the width on infinity, but I can decide to specify the, the number of colons that I'm looking for, right? Um, but I could, I could control this. So this is like for a data frame. I could control this with a table, right? Uh, one way is using the options function, right? So I can put the options function, I put table, I put print, I put max, I can specify this, right? And I can also specify the minimum. So what it says here is, if you have more than M rows, right? Print only N rows, right? So like literally I can I can put what I, the number that I wanted to print for me, rather than just having it spit out this for me, right? Um, uh, then if I also want to show all the possible rows, for example, I could just use options, deployer print, infinity, right? And if I also want to print all the columns, I could also do the same thing here, right? Option table with infinity, so always print all columns, regardless of the width of the screen, right? Um, then, I mean, if you want to see more on these options itself, you could just use package question mark on table, just to kind of get okay, like a, a good a good idea there. Um, the, the other difference between a table and data frame is now subsetting, right? And we'll talk about this a bit more in detail when we get to the exercises itself, right? So obviously there are two ways to subset uh, that we have learned before. Uh, I think when we're, I think, I think Ademi was one of the people that kind of teach us how to kind of subset, if, if I'm wrong. Um, but there are two ways. One is the dollar sign, obviously, and either the double, double bracket, right? Uh, the benefit of a double bracket here is you can extract by name and position and you kind of see what that looks like here, right? Why the dollar sign only extracts by name. So like if I pull this, for example, I created this particular object called DF 
I obviously meditate Tibu and I put particular, you know, variables that I wanted to run for again in it. And I just extract. If I use a dollar sign, I can only extract by name. Right. Um, uh, uh, then if I if I run it within a um, uh, like a double bracket, um, uh, I can extract by name and position. And we'll see how this this kind of plays out to say when we get to the exercise portion. Right. Then I guess the final thing that the chapters try teaching is now about interacting with older code, right? So um, one of the things that um, he mentioned, obviously at the beginning here was the reason why this has to, why TIVO has to be within a package is because you know, most of the innovation you are going to see within R, it's going to come in packages rather than in R itself because R is an old language, right? Um, uh, so at some point you might still need a data frame, right? Even if the chapter is trying to advise that, you know, we don't necessarily um, end up using it. But if you if you have to convert back to it a, a like convert a table that you have created to a data frame, you could just use this function. So add the data frame, as the data dot frame, um, uh, to kind of you know um, convert back to to a data frame. And we can kind of work. There are certain functions that will probably only work with the data frame itself. And it kind of gave like a a quick reason, right? So the the, the reason why is just the single bracket function, right? And, and Obviously, in this book, it's pretty clear. Two things are pretty clear. Number one is uh, we work a lot more with tables in the book itself. I think that's one of the things that the book is trying to teach. And uh, we obviously don't use this as much itself in the book. So, like the single, um, the single bracket, because we have other, you know, uh, sub packages that kind of help out to do what this single bracket is supposed to do. So, like the player filter and the player select, they can actually help you subset the book and like i said we're going to learn more about subsetting um a lot more in detail so the book didn't necessarily go that more detail in terms of subsetting right um so like yeah like i said so i guess this is a very very short chapter um we've kind of finished this in like 30 minutes um uh but i i think it's pretty straightforward i, I think this is literally just the beginning part of the entire rango idea itself and we're literally just starting with the data type that we're using here um, then we kind of go into other ones so like for example you can see the next topic is going to be like import for example so let, i will just stop here first before we kind of go into the exercises which i think i, I actually a lot more exciting than going to the book itself so you guys just let me know if you want me to go through the exercises itself or if you just you know go through that Or if there are any questions that you guys might have from um, the project's Wrangle introduction or tables. I think, yeah, from here, it's um, thank you very much for, for the presentation. It's very clear. Thank you for, mm -hmm. for that. And then, yes, I would love to see the exercises. Fantastic. All right, great. So, so I guess we could just double down on that. So let's go to the exercises. So, so interestingly, uh, I think Code Five kind of helped us out here. They found this particular link. I don't know if you guys have seen this on this on the Slack channel. This link that kind of has all the solutions in the book itself. So I'll I'll just put it in the chat here. Um, uh, and it kind of has a lot more detail. So instead of us trying to you know, literally think think through it itself. Uh, I think a lot more experts, uh, yeah, probably a bit, a bit better to use here. Uh, so we'll probably just use the book itself for exercises, right? So let's start from the beginning. So the first question is, how can you tell if an object is a table, right? And he decided to use this empty cars data set, right? Um, and I guess, so based on the chapter that we just went through, it's pretty clear to see it. Number one is, if I decide to just print this empty cars itself, it literally gives me all the colons. It gives me everything possible, right? The entire data set, which is fine, I guess, if you have like a wide screen. Um, but the, I guess the major, I think the, for me, there are three major differences or why, why I can easily tell if I'm looking at a table. But one is going to be this summarization, right? So it, it's easily just prints out just 10 rows for me. 
Number two is the extra details that it kind of brings. So instead of me having to do like a summary function of these empty cars, if it's a table, it literally gives me like, like a quick summary. How many rows, how many colons? Number three is the, 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 um, the class of each of these um, colons itself, right? Um, so it will tell me what, what they actually are. Um, uh, then let me see if there's anything else. I think, I think that's, those, are, those are like the three major things that kind of jumps out at me whenever I look at a table. So let's, let's see what they said. So number one is, it said, if you convert these empty cards with the data frame into a table using as table, as we have spoken about before, um, it only prints out first 10. So that's what I said. So first 10 observations, right? Uh, and there are also some differences in formatting of the printed data frame, right? So it prints number of rows, right? Here, um, and even up here, right? And also the number of colons and the date type of each of the column, right? Um, then uh, obviously before we kind of kick off, we can use a function called is underscore table to kind of figure out if a data set is a table or also you can also use like a class function to also figure out if a data set is a table. Um, that kind of gives an idea to know if we need to convert it or not, right? So like the, the diamonds that are sets that we've kind of worked with before in the past, obviously are tables. And, and I think I think it was one of the one of the things when Ademi runs code, for example, you kind of see it up top there, you know, what the table kind of looks like and things like that. Similar to the flights, the NYC flight that said we have used. And now that we have converted this empty, empty cars. So you convert it using as table, then try to check the class using is table. Right. So like I said, you can use the class function also to kind of figure out what the data, what the data type it kind of looks like, right? The second question is compare and contrast the following operations on a data frame and equivalent on a table. What's the difference and why is it the four data frame behavior <laughs> cause you frustration? Again, like I said, the book is very big on making us change our thought process on data frames. So instead of using like a base R data frame, try to use a table as much as possible. Um, so we're trying to figure out what are the differences in operations on a data frame and a table, and why does that frame kind of cause you um, some frustration, right? So the first thing, I think one of the major things that I hear is in the subsets. And so, I mean, I'll come back to the code itself, but let's just look at what they've said. So they said, the, the dollar operator will match any column, any column name that starts with the name following it. Since there's a column name XYZ, the expression this will expand to um, uh, this. So let me, let me show you what that means. So this is, if I create this data frame, so let's say I create a random data frame, I called it this and I called like one colon is called ABC and that colon is called XYZ. The data in, in there is for ABC as one, for XYZ as, you know, this and A, right? If I want to subset, right, and I use this, this, the dollar sign, right? It's literally going to subset everything for me here. So it doesn't have any way of differentiating that X, this, this could be different colons. Right, which for me, thinking about it, can easily cause create like a cause for concern for me, right? Um, since it doesn't have a way of differentiating, it's just going to call all the data that is under a particular column for me, because it's kind of guessing, and I'm looking for X, Y, Z, and I just made a mistake and I put only X, right? So like for this, for example, if you run this, it gives you an A, but the actual name of the colon actually is X, Y, Z, right? So that's one of the big things that Tibu kind of Tibu calls you out on this very explicitly. So like, if you try this with Tibu, for example, it's gonna give you a warning. So unknown or un un initialized colon, it also give you an answer null, right? Except when you do it properly, right? That's kind of when it's going to bring it up for you, which I think is, is kind of useful for someone like me that is a beginner user of R. It kind of makes it a bit more cleaner. So at least you don't, you don't kind of make a mistake in your block of code. You kind of have a problem when you're going forward. Um, uh, then it says, so that, that's the problem with the dollar sign. Um, uh, so he said with data frames, the single brackets, this type of object that is returned differs on a number of columns. If it's one column, it won't return a data frame, but instead it will return a vector. With more than one column, it will return a data frame. This is fine if you know what you're passing in. But suppose you did this and this was variable, then what that code depends on, um, then what that code does depend on length this. You'd have to write the code to account for what So the, the, I guess this is where the frustration part is kind of coming from, right? That if you're kind of working with a data frame, 
there's kind of a lot of steps that you kind of have to do. And obviously, I mean, if you're working with a block of code, you could do, you do have to be neat with it and make sure there are no mistakes there. But I mean, if you if you if you're literally writing like a block of code like this, right? So for someone like me that I'm a I started out as an Excel user, for example, so I probably won't face this problem. So if I'm moving into R, there's, there's a lot of moving parts here, and I kind of have to pay very close attention to each of the blocks that are here. So hopefully I do get to that level of expertise. But before I kind of get there, a table kind of solves my problem, right? Where if I want to subset, it just makes things a bit more easier for me having to run, like I have to do a number of checks to make sure that there are no mistakes that are done especially if I try to subset and using like a single, a single bracket, right? So I think that's one of the things that he's trying to teach here, right? And, that, and that's where this frustration part kind of comes in, right? That if I have a, like a long block of code I have to look through, if I'm using a data frame, I have to really, really be very meticulous to make sure that uh, I'm pretty clear because the data frame is not going to call you out, similar to how a, a table is going to call you out. And this kind of warning, I know are quite useful for you to know, you know, if you've made a mistake or not. I think that's one of the things I kind of got from this, from this question itself, All right? So I'll, I'll just do this exercise three and I'll probably pause to see if there are any questions because I think there are probably six of them. Um, so the second part, the third question says, um, if you have the name of a variable stored in an object, so VAR, the object, you store this name in there, how can you extract the reference variable from a table, All right? And we've talked about this before when we talked about subsetting, just use a double bracket, right? So I literally can just use, since I have this object, all right, I can just use a double bracket. Um, you cannot use the dollar sign because this will look for a colon that is literally named VR, all right? Uh, so if you want to subset using a table, just use a double bracket. And I guess everything, everything is going to be fine there. So I'll probably pause here, see if there are any questions before I kind of go forward um, on the next three exercises. So you guys just let me know if I should continue. Yeah, you can continue from here. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I think so. Fantastic, thanks. All right, great. So exercise four. Um, uh, so this one, I actually did not completely understand it, but I, I think I kind of get what it's kind of talk about, but I mean, we'll, we'll touch on it. So practice referencing to non-syntactic names in the following data frame by one extracting the variable code one, plotting a scatter plus code one versus two, creating a new colon code three, blah, 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 blah. So let's, let's, let's go through each of them. Right, so the first thing he said we should do here, let's, let's just create like a data set called annoying, very interesting name. Let's make this data, data set a table, right? Then let's try to extract the variable called one, right? So the first part of the question, right? Again, so like I said, if you want to extract, if you want to subset, just use the double, the double brackets, you literally get what you're looking for, right? Or you could use like a dollar sign, right? The one thing I think I do not get is this um, inverted commas that are up here. Um, I don't know if you guys can help me out on that thought process itself, right? I think maybe one way I kind of thought about it is the, the colons are actually named that, right? But I guess maybe the thing that confused me was why, why is it numerics itself? I don't know if that makes any sense. Does anybody have any idea? But my, my thought process is this is literally like the colon name itself. And if you want to extract it, you just put literally the entire colon name itself. And it could be anything that could be in here. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in numeric. Does that make sense? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think they can use one. Mm -hmm. So I think the, that's why it's uh, in, um, in, in inverted commas now. Yeah. So, so the name of the column is actually not one. It is that, um, mm -hmm. that inverted commas with one, or same thing as two. Yeah. I see, I see, fantastic. Then I guess another interesting thing here is, so in the second column here, for example, it's kind of calling on the first column here and doing some like mathematical operations here. 
interesting. So I guess it's another interesting part of Tibo. Literally, I can do everything I want to do in a single block of code instead of having to do all this, you know, in like separate codes if I'm kind of working like a data frame. All right. So if I want to extract the variable called one, I could either just use the double brackets or I could just use the dollar sign. All right. Sorry, all right. I so think, the, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I think we should interpret that um, that to what is um, going to be the output. Okay. Let Sorry me try this. for taking you back. Yeah, no. I think it's saying one multiplied by two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So, so I, I think what it's trying to say is. Yeah. So this first colon multiplied by two, two. plus. Random like, number. Exactly. Length, length one. one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. make it make the random number to be the same length as this. So it's ten rows, okay. Right, and add it to two, multiply it to okay. each of this. Okay. Right? So I think all this this is just trying to define, literally just the, just the number of rows itself. Okay. Thank you. Thank sure. you. All right, so to create a scatter plot using uh, the two colons that we have. So, I mean, <laughs> we've kind of worked ggplot quite a bit here. It's quite exciting. So ggplot, you enter the data, put it in, a, in your aesthetic, x, you put in the variables, um, and they put a geom point, which is why it's a point itself, and it's kind of what it looks like, right? Again, I think this also brings up an interesting point about table. Literally, I can do all this, in, in a block of code, and I can have all this like assigned already since I've done that up, you know, and, and it's pretty straightforward, right? In, in how I can kind of use a table. So I think I'm kind of liking this table idea. It'll probably take a while for me to adopt it, but I, I think I'm kind of liking the idea of the entire table work itself. But the entire book is kind of based on table, so I probably have to learn it itself. Um, the third sub question there is now to add a third colon. So, like on this, for example, we have two colons one and two. So how do we add a third colon, right? So a third colon is, can I divide colon two by colon one, right? But how, how do I do that? So we learned about a mutate function earlier in one of the lessons that we have done, right? So you can do mutate with the data set, right? So the object that you have created, make three is equals to uh, the, you know, the, my second colon divided by my third colon. Literally, it's going to create it for you, right? Um, and I guess on this, we don't have to specify the length anymore because these two are of the same length, right? And that's kind of what I kind of got from this, right? And obviously, if I check, this is obviously going to be a table because even without seeing any of this up here, I can easily make a guess because it's giving like a very summarized idea of, um, of what the data set kind of looks like, right? The other way we can add a colon is we can do a subset. So, I mean, this is normal with the data frame. It's like a normal function with the data frame. So I can do a subset annoying, a subset three. I kind of, I now assign it to the annoying. I call down the second colon, an annoying, and I call down the first colon, right? And I assign this to create three, right? Or I can do it in a different way, a much longer way. Instead of using the dollar sign, uh, I use annoying. I create this, this three, right? Um, uh, then I, I subset the second colon. Right, so the whole of the second colon, I also subset the whole of the second colon. I put a division sign in between, and I guess I'm fine. Right, and it kind of gives us this, so, right. Um, then the fourth part of the question now says, how do I rename the colons to one, two, and three? Right, uh, so, I mean, literally what we can use here is just this function itself. But I guess the interesting thing here is, we are assigning this to the initial object that we have, kind of, we have created earlier, right? Because we want to rename a column, right? So I can now name one, two, and three, right? All right, using the rename function, all right? Um, I can use glimpse to, um, uh, to, to kind of summarize it. So let, let me correct one of the things I said at the very beginning around what, that it was impossible to create a row name in Tibu. So apparently it is, you just need to call a function called rename. Um, 
for you to kind of do it, right? So one, two, and three, right? The fifth question, so the second to last question says, what does table and frame do? And when might you use it, right? So the simple answer here is the function, this converts a vector to a data frame with names and values, right? So if I have this vector in here, for example, I literally can convert it to a data frame with names and values, right? So which is another interesting thing. I think data frame has its own way that you can do that, but for a table, just use the frame function, right? To convert like a vector itself, which is what you know we're likely going to be kind of kickstarting work with before we kind of have a data frame, except if you are importing data itself, right? Then the final question that says, what option controls how many additional colon names are printed at the footer of a table? So let's look at what the footer of a table looks like. Right. So what function controls additional colons created at the footer of a table, right? So you said the help page for print method of a table is discussed in this, right? Print the table, the n extra argument. Right. So let's, let's just try that. So at least we can just quickly see what that looks like. Uh, so let's try this. It's not even what I'm looking for. All right, I think it should be here. Uh... Yeah, so it's not giving what I'm looking for, but I guess we could just work with this example here. So the, the n extra arguments in a table kind of determines the number of extra colons to print the information for. Um, so, so in case, you know, it, it has a maximum number of colons that is printing. Uh, if I pick a sample table here, let me just go to the other settings. So if I pick a sample table here, in case this is, this is, for example, should be 11 colons, for example, in case we have like 15, you can put n extra as part of this, um, a part of your table function to kind of create, uh, for it to visualize extra colons. All right, so I think that, that kind of brings us to the end of the chapter itself. So like I said, it's a pretty straightforward chapter. I think it's a very useful chapter uh, because I, I think all over where we have been coming from, so we've done visualization and transformation and exploratory data analysis. And we've kind of seen this data set over and over again. So what this, what this at least this part, Rango, is trying to kind of kick starting with is um, for us to kind of understand the data sets itself that, that we are working with here, right? Um, uh, uh, so at least if we, if we have a bit more knowledge about it, it kind of makes it a bit more, everything we have learned earlier, becomes quite clear why, why they kind of have to function that way. And I guess the other thing to kind of also remember is Cebu is also within a package called Tidyverse, right? Um, uh, uh, and if you want to learn more about Cebu's, you just use the Vignette function um, if you want to learn more about Cebu's. So I think that, that brings me to the end of um, my class today. I, I do hope you guys, um, I hope you guys uh, learned something at least. Definitely, I did personally. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank nice you very thing, much. guys. Thank you so much for this yeah. session. Yeah. Thank, thank you. So we would okay, flow so into the next. Uh -huh, please. Yeah. I would want to ask who is taking us next class. Maybe you can uh, prompt. Uh, let me let me just pull that up. Uh, so our next class is you, interestingly. Um, oh yeah, so on that though, one of the things that I Myself? thought about- was, Yep. <laughs> really? One of the things I thought about was, I mean, you, you literally repeated your name here though. Oh, so one okay. of the things I thought about was, our next class is Christmas Eve and the upper class is New Year Eve. I don't think okay. anybody's going to be interested in doing a class on these two dates, except okay. if I'm wrong. So are you guys of the same idea that we should probably push this to next year? No, our um, next class is um when is um uh, today is um uh, ten. Our next class is seventeenth. 
Oh, 17th. My bad, my bad. So, okay. So I think we've kind of frontloaded this. So we could just make this. All right, so this is going to be 17. So we do data import on 17 then. Oh, okay. I didn't know I was I mean, coming that early. Okay. You say 17. Yep. Okay. Okay. God help me. Okay. I mean, if if you if you if you're not ready, I could actually take it because I've actually gone through that chapter also. I, so I, I think also I also enjoyed the reading. I've not been doing huh? much of the reading. I would take it. There's no problem. I also enjoyed Fantastic. the reading. It helps me too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's a book club. So let me do it. Uh, I wouldn't mind. Fantastic. All right. Cool. Cool. Thank you guys very much for your time. Uh, I'll probably Thank just post so much in our group um, on what we have done today and where next we are going next time. I'll be very good rest of the day, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.